webinars and smart conferences. Uh, I would like to remind you, as I was saying, to rename yourself if you haven't done so. Also, you can write the question in the chat at any moment, and we will ask those questions to the speakers at the end of the webinar. So we are very welcome to, to have you hold to our third webinar on Smart Mountains. This belongs to a series of webinars that Sayur Montana is organizing to fuel the discussion for the next European Mountain Convention on Smart Mountains. The European Mountain Convention is a European event where mountain actors can meet and discuss the most urgent challenges and opportunities in mountain areas. The next edition will take place in the Sila Natural Park and Biosphere Reserve in the south of Italy in October 2022. And we will discuss about how to make our mountains more sustainable, attractive, and future-oriented. So in today's webinar, we will discuss about one of the most urgent challenge of our epoch, as you all know, climate change. Climate change is already a fact in all mountain ranges across Europe. And according to a study conducted in 2019, about half of Alpine glacier will melt by 2050, no matter what action we will adopt. So in this concept, context, we want to say that climate change is not only an urgent matter, but it's also an opportunity to rethink new forms of uh, development in mountains, which are more sustainable and resilient. Because of this today, we will try to respond to the question, how can mountain businesses adapt to climate change and what opportunities can they catch to trigger this transition? To kick off the meeting now, I would like to give the floor to Marie Coteau. So Marie, you are director at Euro Montana and you will explain why climate adaptation is inevitable in our mountain areas. So Marie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. In all mountains, climate change is already a reality. Over the last 50 years, the average temperature in the Pyrenees has risen by 30% more than the global average. And since the 1980s, half of the glaciers in the Pyrenees have disappeared with many consequences for tourism, agriculture, biodiversity. In the Carpathians, summer temperatures have sometimes risen up by up to 2.4 above normal, with intense heat waves and an increase in forest fires. Climate change acts faster in mountain regions compared to lowland areas, and it already strongly affects the mountain economy. We already see changes in the hydrological cycle or the retreat of glaciers or permafrost, losses of biodiversity, and in the extreme events. These changes may lead to significant increases in soil erosion, floods, avalanches, and landslides with considerable effects on mountain areas. But these changes are also expected to have various impact not only on mountain environment, economies, and societies, but also on adjacent areas and even far downstream. So adaptation to the inevitable impact is therefore vital. For instance, winter tourism. Each year, tourism activities in the Alps generate approximately 50 billion euro of turnover and provide about 10% of the jobs. And according to Le Gambiante, between 1960 and 2017, the snow season in Italy went through an average reduction of 38 days. And the snow reliability line shifted from 1,500 meters of altitude in, in, into uh, 2,400 in 2006. So these changes have serious consequences on the economic viability of the approximative 300 ski resorts and more than 1,700 ski lifts that exist in Italy. So alternative solutions have to be developed to encourage a full season's tourism. Opportunities can be found in agritourism or rural tourism or summer sport and so on. Climate change is also reshaping mountain agriculture, a sector that represents approximately 20% of agricultural holdings and 50% of agricultural workforce in Europe. Farmers have to develop and use crops and varieties adapt to longer seasons and changes in the availability of water and more resistance to new temperatures. 
They also need to adjust the timing of agricultural operations, such as sowing or mowing or harvesting. And in some cases, a warmer weather can be seen as an opportunity to have new and more crops or vineyard when it was impossible before. In any case, this is now urgent to adapt to the inevitable changes that are going to happen. We need to develop and implement adaptation and transition strategies at local and regional level. But concretely, what does it mean to adapt to climate change when you are a local business? How to do so? How can I be accompanied and supported in this process? And where can I find some inspiring examples? So in our view, if we want the mountain economy to adapt to climate change, we should help local businesses to first understand the coming changes and their consequences at very local level. And it goes with trustable, open and easily accessible data on the climate change scenario in their regions and on the expected impacts in their economic sector. Then we need to help businesses to identify sustainable models to review and adapt their current ways of doing businesses. We should help them to have appropriate tools by giving them new technological and socially driven innovation. And we should also inform them about financing options and facilitate their access to support them in this transition. We should also connect them with similar actors to build capacity and encourage exchange of good practices to share knowledge. If we help our businesses to adapt to changing climate, we avoid that a full ecosystem fails and we create more vibrant and smarter mountains. Some businesses are already following the transition path, such as Metabief or, or some new olive oil production in the Italian Alps or, or the Alp Trees project. So we really hope that their experiences will inspire you. Thank you very much. Carla, you're mute. Carla, we cannot hear you. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Marie, for evoking the impact of climate change in mountains and the vital role of adaptation. And also your call for that includes uh, businesses in the climate adaptation is really, really crucial. And some of the recommendations that uh, you suggested to us are indeed already part of the new European adaptation strategy that has been published by the European Commission last February. So this strategy outlines the pathways and the adaptive action to reduce the impacts of climate change in Europe by 2050. It gives a particular attention on supporting adaptation at all level of governance and in all economic sectors. So how does the Commission wish to do this? To answer this question, I'm very glad to have here with us today, Ms. Elena Vizner Maninovska. So you are head of unit at the Commission Directorate General for Climate Action, and you are in charge of the international mainstreaming and policy coordination of the European Adaptation Strategy. So Ms. Malinoska, over to you for the next 20 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Carla, and thank you very much, Marie, for this very useful framing and focusing of our minds. Let me say that I, I don't work only at the European Commission, but I come from the Carpathian region, from uh, Bratislava. Carpa Carpats have been uh, my view from the balcony, and I'm married to Slovene uh, Alpine region, because this is from where my husband comes from, and uh, this is where we often go uh, to ski, and I'm also a passionate uh, skier so to be uh, you know uh, to, to say I am really uh, my identity is is very uh, closely linked with mountains yet I landed in a in a flat uh, Belgium but that's that's another story so uh, first of all uh, allow me to you know it will be very difficult to respond to the question in in the 20 minutes but allow me to give you at least um, some sort of uh, you know the strategic framing uh, from uh, the uh, let's say european perspective and the orientations we are trying to give and indeed as as marie has put it very eloquently um, the time is on to speak about uh, the impacts that are out there and that we cannot avoid and we have no other choice than to adapt, but let's find opportunities in this process of adaptation because there are indeed uh, many. 
the climate change, you know, uh, a lot of impacts are already baked in and, and the mountainous regions indeed uh, are heating up uh, faster. So the changes are being seen there. And um, just to say, we see that with uh, changes of as far as two degrees, some of the landscapes, some of the alpine tundra ecosystem we are seeing today, they will really seed to uh, the forest areas and they will uh, change uh, probably forever. This is part already even of the media uh, uptake and, and awareness raising that uh, what uh, climate change is for some as, as a sort of remote and abstract uh, trend in the mountains, it's already a, a reality. And we know from the report that has been so instrumental also for the youth movements, uh, the in international panel on climate change report about 1.5 degrees and how to cap actually the global warming, it does list the high mountain ranges uh, among the specially affected and sensitive areas. Now allow me to uh, explain the policy context in which we are operating, which, uh, which is very favorable to green agenda. Uh, which is the European Green Deal that became uh, the main uh, priority for this commission and that, if you wish, uh, outlines or dictates uh, the, the sense of direction uh, to other policies like the financial policy, like uh, economics, like budgets, and now also very importantly, uh, the recovery. And, and this is the sort of frame, the sort of painting in which the climate adaptation strategy is sitting. And it does cooperate very much with the other areas like biodiversity, like the upcoming forest strategy or the climate law that has been just uh, adopted and which really puts obligation on member states to prepare national adaptation plans and, and to assess uh, the vulnerabilities coming with increased climate risks. Now, uh, you've mentioned how it is important to uh, you know, uh, sell or to, to explain uh, to, to local ad actors uh, what is out there uh, on, on climate adaptation. And we are quite proud about the participatory and inclusive process that led to the adoption of the uh, climate adaptation strategy, because we did uh, a massive outreach in terms of uh, different webinars, uh, the public consultation. And of course, we discussed with member states, with regions, and we've got very good insights uh, also from, from our research. Now, this is the first time we provide a real objective and a vision for climate adaptation, which was before a sort of process of adapting towards something unknown. Now we know that the unknown is indeed threatening. It is threatening us with loss or economic loss, but also human losses when it comes to uh, affecting uh, our health. And so we have a vision of a climate resilient Europe by 2050, which needs to be built, uh, of course, as of today, which means we need to increase our adaptive capacity. We need to reduce the um, vulnerabilities and, and definitely increase increase the resilience of ecosystems, of our businesses, of our operations to the climate risks that are already known. And this vision has been translated in, in different uh, objectives, which is the smart adaptation, really improving knowledge and managing uncertainty, because we know many times in, in policies like the environmental policies, you have a lot of unknowns, yet you have to take a decision on a certain investment. More systemic adaptation, so really support what you mentioned, uh, uh, Carla, uh, policy development at all levels and sectors. Climate adaptation, let me uh, say it very loudly, is a teamwork. 
is a collaborative work and, and you cannot do it uh, on your own. Be it, uh, uh, you know, you a, a region or you a farmer or you an operator of a hydropower or you a, a data analyst or a mayor uh, of, of a city. Faster, we have been speaking over years about the impacts and hazards that are out there. We have a lot of scientific knowledge on it. So we need, we need to roll out uh, the uh, adaptation solutions that are out there and many of them are relatively common sense. They can be technical, non-technical, organizational. And of course, we need also uh, to step up international resilience because this is where the fate of Europe uh, also uh, lies. On smarter adaptation, as I mentioned, we, we want to push the frontiers of knowledge on adaptation and what is out there. We need to have much more in information on distributional impacts. We need to have much more examples of good practices, uh, much more economics of adaptation in terms of what are the costs, what are the benefits. For instance, you mentioned the forest fires. Now, the, the forest fires eat up on average every year 75 uh, million uh, euro uh, that uh, have been, uh, you know, calculated thanks to uh, an alpine uh, project. Whereas you could invest up from 10 million uh, euro for uh, a sort of early warning system and integrated uh, management uh, of forests. We need to have better information about climate related risk and losses data. Uh, in Europe, we have incurred losses, uh, be it with burnt uh, forests, uh, be it with flooded uh, areas or even species disappearing. The conservative estimate is 12 billion of these losses occurring on average every year. But we still miss uh, a complete picture of, or as a where it happened and we need to collect this lost data because at least it, it provides the, the better, you know, uh, baseline for us to assess then whether our measures are uh, being successful and picking up. We have also Climate Adapt, that is a repository, uh, I call it uh, the first to meet uh, adaptation platform, where you can find already uh, very good practices, adaptation uh, solutions for different sectors, including, for instance, the forestry sector, the agriculture sector or, or tourism uh, that uh, come from, from different countries. More systemic adaptation, uh, I think everybody needs a plan. Plan is part of the ancient art we always had. And, and you need to have this plan, even if you are a, a small business, even if you are a city, if you are a region, and if you are uh, definitely a member state. Now we have all member states with their strategies, with their national adaptation plans, but these plans need to be also accompanied with budgetary commitments. They need to be improved also on, on climate scenarios and, and they need to be really rolled out uh, as, uh, as uh, speedily as possible. We need also to foster what we call local resilience. We, we see that a lot of outdoor uh, activities will indeed suffer. Of course, there are funds to help, like the European Social Fund for reskilling of, of some uh, workers. But more and more, we need to, to think about uh, what we call just resilience, you know, in, in the um, uh, perspective of the uh, climate mitigation, so cutting of emissions, we many times speak about, you know, uh, going out of coal and how you can uh, transit towards, uh, you know, um, coal-free future. And, and so in, in terms of the climate adaptation, how you make sure that also the intervention on adaptation doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't impose additional um, uh, unjustified or uh, unjust uh, uh, measures. Uh, less relevant, but still very important, when we talk about budgets, often you have ministries of treasury saying, do I have to spend on something if I don't, I don't know whether this is not a stranded asset? Typically, if you're uh, you know, adapting to a future threat, uh, you know, it doesn't seem immediately as, as the best investment on day one for the Ministry of the Treasury. But this is where we need to start, uh, you know, um, 
uh, stress testing the, the budgets of countries and to say if one in, in a 50 years um, event happens and it happens every five years, what does it mean for, uh, for instance, for the GDP? And I am sure, uh, you know, uh, there will be a a listener uh, in the, at the Ministry of Treasury at that point. We say it all the time, promoting nature-based solutions uh, for adaptation, this is uh, very important, yet it happens uh, now more as a reactive safeguard and, and more at, at, at a small scale. And I think indeed in mountainous regions, you know, what else you should uh, implement than the nature-based solutions. Nevertheless, uh, we see also in the recovery plans uh, that some of the ideas for the climate adaptation in, in forestry are more the technical cement uh, or gray-based uh, uh, measures that, uh, that we would like to avoid. So nature-based solutions uh, by, uh, to, to start with. Faster. Uh, we are trying to accompany now the strategy with uh, what we call a mission on adaptation. It's, it's, a, it's a pool of research and innovation money that will go into uh, equipping some regions with climate vulnerability assessments and risk vulnerability assessments so that, that the, the, there is an increased uptake also of, of solutions uh, for going forward and towards the division I have outlined. We need to reduce climate related risk in, in system. Typically, if you have uh, transport routes or energy uh, routes uh, in, in the mountains and you know how it is disruptive, uh, for instance, uh, the ice melting that can be brusque suddenly and, and that can you know, affect and disrupt uh, some, some networks. So you need to uh, climate proof, if you wish, uh, this future uh, infrastructure so that you reduce uh, this risk uh, to create for you uh, major blackouts or, or major problems. What we have also realized is that there is not a perfect uh, risk transfer mechanism. For instance, you cannot avoid all uh, the impacts, but at least you need some compensation in case that the damage happens. And so we are having a very uh, intensive uh, dialogue now with insurers or any providers of risk transfer mechanism. And this is really important for a business like the uh, ski lift uh, owners that indeed uh, see increasingly the um, insurers, you know, stepping out of the business, not insuring certain operations for certain altitudes because they uh, just don't see uh, this uh, as, as possible. And of course, uh, fresh water, uh, you know, in, in, in the mountains, uh, increasingly important with uh, the, the risks uh, that Marie mentioned with the heat waves. But also, if I operate a hydropower in, in the mountains, you know, what does that mean in, in terms of the design? Uh, what are the plans? Uh, how we can work on a cross boundary uh, perspective between regions and, and between uh, member states? And of course, we engage very much, as, as you know, adaptation, climate adaptation is still perceived as, as a national competence to a huge extent because it has to do with, uh, for instance, uh, the water resources, the spatial planning, the building codes. Uh, so indeed, we do respectfully subsidiarity and local nature of adaptation. At the same time, we see an increased interest from member states to work across Europe and, and to really uh, see what are the common collective uh, solutions that could be transplanted uh, elsewhere. And of course, this comes with uh, big support of local experience and expertise uh, and, and regional uh, push. So there, of course, the, the, the let's say my level, the, the level of European Union is there to uh, provide, you know, uh, financial help, but also knowledge and tools, because it, it is really at, at the level of, of Europe that we pull a lot of resources for research that can be then uh, redistributed uh, throughout Europe uh, to, to help. And I would uh, end with really the sort of invitation that this is the teamwork <laughs> and uh, for, for a better resilience in the future, we really need to work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena, for giving us this very, very comprehensive look, outlook on the European adaptation strategy. And in fact, as you were stressing the need to adapt now, but also to speed up this acceleration 
and uh, in the strategy, in fact, uh, is, uh, is identified as one of the key actors to accelerate the rollout of adaptation and the solution, the EIT, Climate Knowledge and Innovation Community, also known as uh, Climate Kick. So for those of you who are not familiar with Climate Kick, this is the largest public-private partnership in Europe dedicated to accelerate climate innovation for mitigation and adaptation. And uh, so far, it's incubated more than 2,000 climate positive companies and created 10,000 jobs via its startup communities. So today we have with us here Salvatore Martire. So he is uh, working at, uh, for the regional innovation scheme at Climate Kick. And uh, Salvatore, could you please explain us what type of opportunities can come from climate adaptation from your point of view? And how does, in fact, Climate Kick also support climate adaptation? So the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Many thanks to Eva Montana for the invitation. It's, of course, an opportunity to share what uh, Climate Kick is uh, doing in this domain but also to, to listen, to learn what's going on in uh, mountain areas, what are the challenges, needs, opportunities from, uh, from European Union and beyond. And I, yes, I also share a, a personal interest for mountain areas beyond climate kick before that, and also a, 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 a professional one and a personal one. And actually this, background picture is not far from uh, Sila. It's in another national park in my nearby my, my hometown. So uh, it's very good that there is this attention for internal areas and, and uh, mountain uh, communities. And in my presentation, I will surface uh, what Climate Kick is doing in, uh, in this domain. So trying to identify and highlight or just mention some uh, activities which may be of interest to, to this community. Um, and uh, of course, we can uh, consider later whether Ed, is there anything of particular interest, something to, to uh, try to go a little bit deeper uh, or to connect with. That would be very, very um, very nice and, and uh, uh, interesting to do. Uh, this is uh, the 2020 pictures of our partnership. And uh, what I want to say here is that uh, Climate Kick, uh, uh, as the other kicks, is working uh, with many actors, many different actors, uh, business from uh, startup to large uh, companies, uh, local authorities, and policymakers and uh, uh, the uh, academia and, and research center. And we work across multiple sectors. So uh, on climate change mitigation and adaptation. So we have a very diverse partnership, which uh, makes it uh, a definitely a strength of, of the organization. And we try to address the climate change related challenges, challenges through climate innovation. Uh, thank you for mentioning the recognition of uh, uh, the EU adaptation strategy, and it's which is also saying that we need to step up the uh, climate effort and adaptation effort. And uh, uh, I would say that Climate Kick definitely share the, this point, and uh, uh, we really want to um, to invest and be involved much more in in uh, climate adaptation. Uh, because in the years, uh, uh, perhaps mitigation has had a, a, a bigger role in business creation, while the, the uh, idea and also some elements which I will try to provide you during this presentation are looking at how we can make a, from adaptation also de deriving some, some uh, economic business opportunities. Um, we have been working on, on together with that, our partners or, or led by our partners, many innovation in, in this domain on climate risk information, resilience, adaptation. Uh, and here there is a little bit of an overview of uh, and various links to, to some in activities which can be of interest for, for 
uh, mountain businesses. Uh, the message of this slide is basically that uh, there is technology. So we have been, uh, and our partners have been developing uh, uh, products and services, platform and tools, but also there is a, a, a strong need for capacity building, training, uh, understanding better how the financial system can, uh, uh, how, uh, climate adaptation can be leveraged by the, the financial system and also uh, policy and governance aspects which are of uh, as we just heard of, of key importance for stepping up uh, climate adaptation effort uh, you will also find a, a link to to our innovation portfolio so it's more technological innovation but not only uh, that were have been developed over 2020, and I will also come back a little bit later on this. Uh, the regional innovation scheme of Climate Kick is uh, um, basically a, a network, and um, with the idea to to mobilize uh, local players, um, making uh, different local contexts interact with each other. And uh, uh, we have several apps and partners active in the regional innovation scheme uh, uh, network. Uh, and of course, there is also non risk uh, activities. So this is uh, just a little um, highlight and zoom on, on uh, how we work in risk because risk, many uh, areas of, of this program are uh, considered uh, among the most vulnerable regions in Europe. And adaptation is definitely a priority for us, has been a priority for the, the previous strategy and is likely to be also a priority for the strategy we are developing uh, uh, right now for AT Climate Kick risk, uh, risk Program. And here there is a um, consideration on the uh, economic damages uh, estimation uh, from uh, climate impacts, but of course there is, as it was, uh, mentioned earlier, much more than that, social and environmental implications that are extremely, uh, extremely relevant. Uh, I mentioned the um, the importance of technology. Uh, here, I'm I'm also highlighting a little bit the the importance of of innovation ecosystem and fostering innovation ecosystem. Uh, an example is a partner-led project on the wine and vine value chain. Uh, operating in um, European, some Med Mediterranean countries of Europe. Uh, and here the, the focus is actually to, to foster innovation ecosystem, which uh, would be uh, enabling uh, technology and uh, other innovation to be scaled at local level. Uh, and especially the focus of this, of this project is on uh, vine and wine value chain uh, you see the the partner involved but uh, these type of projects want to be as open as possible as collaborative as possible and interact also with other contexts other projects and and be really a um, a bridge uh, between uh, the innovation and uh, coming from research and the market opportunity for it and, and, and this is especially dedicated to, to the wine and vine uh, sector and, and adaptation challenges in relation to the wine and vine sector. We have been also uh, working in very different contexts in uh, Sweden, in Gothenburg, Birmingham, and in uh, uh, Trentino in Italy on developing um, basically a, a better or new understanding around the relationship between urban areas and their surroundings. So what, what are the opportunities for, for agriculture in, in surrounding of, of uh, towns and cities and how we can better connect the urban, peri-urban and rural areas in Europe. Uh, and this project has developed some pathways of change, which means basically some, um, uh, I think it could be interesting for what was um, mentioned earlier uh, uh, in, in, um, in terms of developing strategies, developing plans, which are um, 
building on, on a teamwork. I really like that, that invitation and really building on what is the vision of the local communities of their future and what would be the action needed to make this, this vision a, a reality as soon as possible. Uh, we cooperate also with other kicks, um, perhaps not a, a key challenge exactly mountain area water scarcity but if we look at mountain areas in a, in a wider context uh, that could be interesting uh, because we are uh, trying to advance uh, a little bit the understanding on how innovation can help to tackle water scarcity in Europe together with uh, other kicks manufacturing raw materials and food um, and the idea is to um, basically Yes, as I said, it's like, what can innovation do uh, when it comes to water scarcity? And there is a number of activities in relation to, to this stream that are including uh, the um, mobilization of expertise on this topic, but also business creation and uh, uh, other activities always in relation to, to, to boost innovation in, in Europe. Uh, Early this year was launched uh, an innovation adaptation marketplace. This is more connected to our entrepreneurship activities. There is more to come this year on this, on this topic. This is just a, a snapshot of it, but with a larger partnership, we are trying to foster business opportunity uh, in relation to, to adaptation. This is not the only initiative, more will come, but this can be interesting for who is uh, looking, who has an entrepreneurial spirit and is looking at adaptation as a, um, a challenge on which to build uh, new, new business opportunities. And uh, uh, what we have been learning over uh, these 10 years is that uh, we need to, uh, to work on multiple levels of change, technology, fundamental but we need to step it up to work across uh, and with many actors and across many sectors and uh, uh, using multiple levels of change uh, for this reason in 2019 together with the, our uh, climate kick new strategy we launched a new program called deep demonstration with the idea to uh, demonstrate that the 1.5 degree consistent system transition is possible. And we basically are trying to uh, rethink or, or, or um, experiment a new way to do innovation, which is much more uh, um, connected with the decision-making level, which is giving feedback to, to the innovation itself, if it's serving the purpose of uh, what is our our mission and our vision, and if uh, how it can uh, how we can derive relevant insights for decision makers coming from the, the climate innovation perspective. And and I don't know if I mentioned this at the very beginning, but my uh, current role is mainly on on trying to to develop a. a, a um, a uh, solid system of, of exchanging information between decision makers and, and innovation portfolios. Uh, for who is more into innovation activities, it means instead of uh, connecting existing projects and, and um, trying to uh, identify uh, how we can connect single projects, we are trying to identify what can be a, a system and, and a, a space to connect and to, and to co-design uh, multiple innovation activities on, on technology and on policy, on uh, uh, startup acceleration, for example, and, uh, and so on. We have been working on many uh, regions with, um, and uh, uh, also national level, uh, at community level and at value chain level across Europe. One, of, one set of, of this deep demonstration is on uh, forging resilient at uh, local level. And uh, uh, we have been uh, 
2019, we started to work with a group of, um, of uh, local communities and, and uh, local partners and also cross-cutting partners in trying to understand how we can uh, um, connect multiple innovation, how we can work in, uh, on resilience, on adaptation in a much, more, uh, in a much faster way. Uh, the, the result of this first uh, less than two years of work uh, are mainly in relation to visualizing and proposing portfolio of innovation, visions for, for local communities, connecting also business actors uh, at local level, and, uh, um, this, uh, and working with local and cross uh, uh, cross-cutting uh, uh, partners, we developed um, some project areas in relation to, to adaptation and resilience that are touching on, on different levels of change, and especially working in uh, mountain communities, in the Dolomites, we have seen how this topic is actually extremely relevant for tourists, uh, local communities, and, and forestry and wood uh, uh, value chain, and also biodiversity concerns. And uh, we have identified three dimension resilience systems and, and type of response in which innovation can be nurtured, that can be, can be funded, and what are the, the emerging needs on uh, on this aspect. I, as I mentioned this at the beginning on, on capacity building, uh, strong uh, interest and, and need is also coming from uh, uh, how to, to rethink and how to uh, experiment new insurance schemes, for example, for uh, wood value chains, and how we can uh, um, cooperate in, in risk management at local level. Then, of course, this is probably varying across Europe, but the um, there is a need also to, to understand how risk management can be tackled by, by communities and not leaving also, for example, mayors alone to take decisions on, uh, on very delicate matters and, and the how to handle risk uh, management, response, early warning is, of course, a, an increasing uh, need locally. Uh, in, in conclusion, uh, what I try to do here is to uh, try to, to give you a bit of an overview of what can be interesting from uh, climate kick related work to, to mountain communities and adaptation. Something may be, may be missing here, but uh, of course, if there is anything of particular re relevance, then we can also try to, to go a little bit more in details. And basically what we want to do in, in the months, weeks, and years to come is to work with the most vulnerable communities to adopt solutions and implement resilience plans in line uh, uh, with the EU adaptation strategy. Uh, I have also showed you um, some, some uh, efforts to connect locally led business creation with investors, and this is uh, going to, to be um, developed uh, in over this year, uh, so perhaps later this year with a bit more details and opportunities in terms of calls and, uh, and uh, funding opportunities. And uh, uh, use uh, system innovation approach, uh, uh, climate innovation for more, a more systemic approach to adaptation, so connecting the, the insights we can draw from, uh, from better connected innovation actions within a portfolio to uh, um, adaptation at local level. And so basically trying to, um, to make, uh, um, to connect also different sectors and, and different needs. Uh, coming back to the work, for example, in, um, in the Dolomites, of which I, I've, I've showed you, I, I've mentioned earlier, we have noticed that there is a need to connect much more, uh, for example, tourism, uh, touristic activities with, with local planning. And uh, uh, there is a need also to 
to uh, support the local actors, local policymakers to have more coordination uh, between themselves uh, and, and with local actors and also connecting across uh, uh, multiple levels uh, in, uh, at, at EU level, member states and, and so on. And, and we believe here innovation has a role to play. It can, it's the place where we can experiment and possibly scale very fast new model of, of doing adaptation, of planning for it and, and implementing with this, uh, this plan. And I uh, thank you very much again for uh, uh, this opportunity. Thank you to you, Salvatore, and uh, it was very interesting. And thank you for your work. In fact, the climate kick is very important for, as you were mentioning, bringing different actors together, which is what we need for climate adaptation and accelerating this work. And among the opportunities that you list, for example, the innovation adaptation marketplace is very interesting, as well as deep demonstration could be used as a tool to foster adaptation in uh, mountain communities. So I invite also the, the participants to have a deeper look at in uh, in these uh, in these programs, and uh, and now uh, talking in fact about the developing adaptation measure, I would like to move to three concrete cases in our mountains. So this example showcases how some sector of the mountain economy, namely the tourist sector, the agricultural sector, and the forestry sector, can adapt uh, to future climate scenarios. So I will start with uh, the first example that brings us in the Metabit ski station that's situated in the Jura Mountains in France. Here, a study revealed that snow will probably not exist anymore by 2040. So the MetaBeef took the ambitious decision to announce the end of the ski tourism by 2035 and launch a new co-constructing plan to develop an all year round tourism. Today we have with us uh, Mr. Olivier Erard. So Olivier, you are the director of uh, Syndicat Mix du Monde d'Or in France. Uh, Mr. Erard, could you explain us what you plan to do so to overcome the end of snow in the MetaBeef ski resort? Yes, hello everybody. Uh, thank you, Carla. Thank you. Uh, thank to Euro Montana for this invitation. Um, so I will present you um, what is um, the strategic thinking of Metabia Resort to adapt uh, to climate change. Um, Metabia is located uh, in the east of France, not far from the the Swiss border, uh, not far from Bern, uh, Lausanne, Besançon, in the area which is called uh, Odou, uh, in the Jura Mountains. Metabier Resort is a medium altitude uh, resort from uh, 900 to 1,400 uh, meters, with 40 kilometers of ski slopes for uh, all levels and a snowmaking factory, uh, which covers about 40% of ski area. So it's a good, uh, uh, it's a good ratio. Uh, and uh, in summer, we exploit also downhill mountain bike uh, park with uh, 25 kilometers of trail for all levels and uh, an alpine coaster. And uh, we are able to carry uh, people for mountain hiking uh, so you have a, a picture which, which shows our uh, landscape. Um, first, uh, I would like to present you what is the present business tourist model of uh, uh, Odu area. Um, in fact, we have the um, Metabier ski resort uh, with, is quite in the center of uh, the, the system. Uh, around you have uh, tourist operators and uh, other tourist areas with strong interdependence between ski resort and other tourist operators. And uh, in this system, uh, the ski resort generates uh, about 50% of tourist revenues of, by uh, downhill ski activities. Um, now climate change uh, is really a threat on the present model. So the question is how to Sorry, how to make it an, an opportunity. Uh, first, I have to explain you uh, what is uh, our um, strategy, uh, strategy thinking, um, which is based on uh, an internal 
approach. Uh, you have to understand that it's a, it's a bottom up process. Um, uh, so in uh, 2017, uh, we have made an internal approach of climate change effects on uh, downhill skiing uh, by using two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is based on a, a regional climate model, uh, which uh, think that uh, limit rain snow will increase of uh, 100 meters for 10 years. And the uh, second hypothesis is uh, based on alpine thesis and analysis uh, of local data, uh, which uh, think that um, time available to make snow, uh, artificial snow, uh, will lose uh, about six years, six hours per year. So uh, we have planned, uh, so here you are, all the areas uh, of, uh, uh, ski we we exploit and uh, that's a picture in uh, 2020 and in 2025 uh, we we'll lo we lose uh, the lowest um, area but it's always uh, we, we can always reach a financial balance with this uh, system but uh, since uh, 2030 we we lose another area where we have um, um, so um, area where we, we can learn ski. So that's a very important area for us. And uh, since this moment, it's, uh, it's very complicated to, to have uh, a uh, financial balance. And in uh, 2035, it, uh, it became, it becomes very uh, economically non-viable. So that, wa that was the first approach we made about uh, uh, climate change effects. And uh, in 2020, we apply uh, a cli uh, climate model uh, developed by uh, Météo France, which, uh, calls, uh, which is called uh, Climb cl climb Snow, and uh, show us uh, a lack of snow and cold on uh, snow fronts below 1,000 meters, starting from 2030. Less than 60 days of possible exploitation of uh, downhill skiing in red areas around uh, 2035 and 2040, and only few ski slopes with uh, artificial snow over 1,100 meters until uh, 2040. So that makes only 30% of possible exploitation. Um, so the conclusion is uh, that in 2030, it's, uh, we, are, we, are, we will have very bad conditions on ski product on snow fronts. In 2035, uh, less than uh, 60 days of possible exploitation without snowmaking. So that is not um, economically viable, uh, viable. And 2040, only 30% of possible exploitation uh, that generates uh, less than 50% of sale revenues. So uh, we have a great loss of tourist attractiveness starting from 2030 and critical situations in 2035. Um, I will show you the, the chronology of uh, highlights. Uh, first, uh, our internal approach uh, in 2016, uh, based on uh, local data and snowmakers analysis. That's very important to um, to hear what snowmakers uh, say. Technical innovation to maintain ski lifts without big investments. It's a main uh, issue uh, of the, um, the transition of uh, a model for a uh, ski resort. And uh, dialogue, pedagogy, and storytelling, that's also uh, very important. Uh, that involves strong commitment made by uh, elected officials and uh, involving employees in climate change topic. Um, that's why uh, since uh, 2018, um, we, 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 have, we had a, a very changed acceptance. Um, and it was, the, the, we, have, we had the opportunity to uh, develop engineering from climate change transition, specific uh, engineering from climate change transition to launch uh, the dynamic process of change. And uh, when uh, we made uh, the climate snow model um, 
that that was only um, the final act of our uh, approach, uh, which allowed uh, us to uh, to write a climate change transition strategy. Uh, so. What's, uh, what is our uh, climate change strategy transition for our ski resort? Um, between today and uh, Horizon uh, 2030, 2035, we plan to maintain downhill ski with limited investment and decreasing the snow dependent debt. It's very important. And um, we developed also uh, sustainable outdoor activities on the mountain massif uh, in order to increase in environmental wealth uh, of the area and preserve pastoralism and uh, forestry. So uh, we don't want to uh, artificialize uh, the, our mountain, that's very important, but with this model, the, the risk uh, uh, in 2030 is to a loss of 50% uh, of the tourism revenues. So that means uh, probably the end of tourism or maybe an opportunity to build a new model. Um, so before I um, answer to this question, uh, I, I, want, I want to show you what is, uh, um, how we can uh, make a climate change an opportunity to build a new model. So the main change uh, it consists uh, in, uh, in thinking that uh, the system score uh, is, con um, uh, is major. sorry for my English is very bad, but it's the first time I make this presentation in English. <laughs> uh, I hope I, uh, I am understandable. Um, so the system score is composed by uh, touristic operators, uh, territorial collectives in and uh, local inhabitants. And um, from this system, we can build um, several uh, areas, touristic areas, uh, and uh, that makes um, an over model. And the goal is to reach a new community activities based on natural and patrimonial wealth, adapted to climate change and sustainable, able to replace the revenues or losses due to the end of uh, downhill ski. Um, the main problem is that we don't know what is the new model. We don't, uh, it's very difficult to project uh, on um, the, final, uh, the, the final model. But what we know is that we have to, uh, to use all the ingredients uh, uh, to, to success. And these ingredients are the values and frame of the new model and cooperation. So what are the values and the frame for this uh, new tourism model? Uh, we have uh, created a, a brand to mark the turning point in tourism strategy. Uh, this mark is O by Montagne du Jura, and the frame for the action, uh, this logo is Odu, uh, with a, a frame uh, uh, outdoor nature. I think the connection that's uh, oh. public, humanism, uh, circular economy, innovation, and, and uh, environment, and for uh, and for the cooperation, uh, we have developed a new system. Uh, in France, we uh, we have uh, Levi on ski pass uh, from uh, all uh, ski resorts. Uh, when you uh, buy a ticket for skiing, you pay also a Levi. Uh, and uh, so uh, we use uh, part of this Levi to finance an engineering for a climate change uh, transition. So for three days, we have developed uh, project management for ski resort transition. And now we are able to make a, a change management uh, with all the uh, stakeholders, uh, territorial collectivities, tourist operators, local inhabitants, clubs, and uh, in uh, in place, uh, uh, the the main actor of this transition now is the tourism office, and we have also created a place, a, a kind of think tank, for a smart mountain. We were, where we hope to develop uh, innovation and collective intelligence, uh, which call uh, Lab O. 
and um, th that could product and contribute to uh, build a new model. Uh, so uh, territorial collectivities and uh, tourist operators uh, will be able to produce investment and customer services and uh, uh, tourism office uh, contribute to link between uh, tourism and territory, uh, tourism promotion and uh, animation um, in taking, uh, taking uh, in account evolving uh, customers practices and new trends. Um, sorry. So that involves a progressive construction of a new tourist model on the Odu area. Uh, so we have to um, to manage the time. So we we want to to make some project. So we have uh, already first achievements. Uh, for instance, uh, we have developed uh, an e-bike network with digital tools for touristic discovery. On all the, the two Odu uh, area, we have uh, created an ultra trail uh, on Jura Mountain, and uh, we also have developed um, a federation of outdoor uh, clubs. Now we we, we work on uh, mountain bike trail running and Nordic walking project uh, on all the area with uh, uh, several uh, spots. Um, for uh, developing uh, uh, mountain bike, uh, trail running, uh, Nordic walk. Uh, and uh, so here we, you are uh, five spots uh, with different uh, vocations for family, for bike training, uh, for bike uh, gravity, uh, trail center and the mountain bike uh, nature. And uh, we are, also ongoing uh, studies and experimental project. For instance, uh, uh, we, we, we work on uh, outdoor for disabled persons. We have made a master plan for investments adapted to climate change. And also we work on a sustainable outdoor with uh, uh, good habits to, to practice all the uh, outdoor activities. And um, in our... Um, think tank, we develop also uh, ideas uh, from design fiction work session. Here you have some uh, instance. Uh, for instance, uh, you, you have the Federation of uh, Tourist Operators for buying, lending, repairing, and reselling outdoor tools, uh, which called uh, La Coke O. Uh, we are thought uh, about a new touristic activity uh, in uh, autumn and uh, winter, but without snow. Uh, we have also planned uh, construction of mountain bikes made in Jura. So, um, for in conclusion, uh, uh, now we uh, we have to to work on uh, on cooperation with uh, all the the stakeholders, the stakeholders, um, and we have to meet the challenge. Thank you very much, uh, Olivier, for your presentation. And I think that uh, really that's an inspiring example. And the key words of uh, your practice are, in fact, uh, the ability of bringing actors together, but also diversify your activities. And I hope this could inspire other participants here. So now going to the next example. So we remain at the half of Europe, and we talk about changes in uh, mountain agriculture. So as we know, with the increase uh, of temperature, the production of some crops, such as, for example, olive, olive trees, is moving to higher altitudes. And this is opening interesting marketing opportunities for agribusinesses in the Italian Alps. So we have here with us today Valeria Leoni. So Valeria, you are a research fellow at uh, the Dislocated Center of the University of Milan in Adolo, Italy. And uh, Valeria, could you please explain us how the agribusiness sector is evolving in the Italian Alps because of uh, climate change and how it's adapting? So 15 minutes to you. Okay, sorry. Okay, thank you, Carla, for introducing me. As Carla said, I work at the research center Unimont, that is a research center for the mountain development, where we do both teaching and research. 
we are located uh, in the middle of two important alpine valleys that are uh, Valtellina and uh, Valle Camonica. So what uh, uh, we saw in this area recently, working with uh, the colleagues and the farmers and looking at the news of the agricultural world, we saw the expansion north of some unusual, unusual um, cultivations, among which, uh, for, of course, the olive tree is probably the more uh, impressive because uh, it's not usually associated to a mountain uh, landscape, it's uh, more associated to uh, a Mediterranean landscape, of course. Um, so can we talk uh, of, uh, a, of a return of, uh, or of a conquest? Actually, we, we cannot talk about a conquest because uh, the olive tree uh, was already cultivated uh, in the Alps uh, in, during the, optimum, uh, the climatic optimum in the Middle Age. And uh, we have uh, both uh, historical uh, evidences of these and natural uh, evidences. As for example, the centuries old stamps that were discovered by, our, the, by the Fondazione Foglianini di Sondrio. So Fondazione Foglianini di Sondrio is actually our neighbor. Uh, the, is, the, is a research center in Valtellina, so next to us. And uh, we collected uh, their decennial experience in the words of Ivano Foglianini from Fondazione Foglianini di Sondrio. So Foglianini Foundation started to work with uh, the olive grove uh, in the 90s uh, to help uh, some pioneers and uh, to propose ideas to recover uh, the abandoned traditional terraced uh, vineyards of, of uh, Valtellino. So differently from other crops, uh, this was a very good idea. It was a successful and uh, the olive trees grew well in the following years with the qualitative and the productive uh, characteristics comparable to those of the traditional cultivation area, the near cultivation area that is uh, the Lake Como. So this led to the trend of the last decade that, that was the increase of about 1,000 uh, olive trees per year, and at the moment uh, in the Valtellina mountains there are about 20,000 plants. Uh, so of course the climate change had an important role in this because uh, we could see that for several years the olive trees have come winter out unscathed and they are in good condition in spring, and paradoxically in the, they were, there were less damage from frost in this area where uh, the harsh wind make uh, the plant sleep well during the cold than in warmer areas. So the olive tree showed also great uh, adapt adaptability to periods of uh, lack of water in the terraced uh, areas. And uh, also winters uh, were, uh, were perceived mild uh, uh, by local farmers and this led to an increase of uh, of the activity of cultivation, in particular in the abandoned uh, areas. Uh, uh, we, uh, we have, of course, also uh, cultural and social uh, trends involved, in particular uh, the willingness to recover the territory uh, by the young generation that uh, have also a different idea of agriculture and uh, Olive tree is a rustic plant uh, suitable for low input, low input crops, uh, coherent with the new idea of agriculture that must be sustainable. So, uh, and, and another reason is uh, that olive tree is a fascinating plant and is linked uh, to, any, to an idea of a, of a healthy diet, uh, comparing to the traditionally used uh, anima, animal fat, uh, that, fats that are usually uh, uh, utilized uh, in the mountain uh, areas. So, of course, uh, then olive cultivation is leading to a positive intervention in, in the area with a positive, uh, um, 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 positive intervention also in the land management. And uh, uh, the olive tree represents a good transitional, transitional cultivation for the recovery of the raised uh, area, areas abandoned for decays, decays because uh, it uh, prevents the reforestation and prepare the land uh, for the planting of vineyard. 
that is traditional and uh, uh, more economically sustainable. So, uh, of course, then uh, olive growing will never be a substitute uh, for other uh, traditional crops uh, as a vineyard, but uh, uh, will be a good uh, solution to recover uh, uncultivated area, areas and, and for the maintenance of uh, uh, the most disadvantaged, disadvantaged uh, areas. Uh, so, uh, for the future trends, uh, of course, uh, the vineyard will always be preferred. By, by young farmers because uh, it's traditional of the valley and is uh, more valid and profitable. But in the area outside of the vocated areas, uh, I mean outside of the DOCG CG areas, uh, probably there will be another uh, spread of uh, olive cultivations, cultivation. Uh, we observed also other non-traditional plants as a saffron. And uh, uh, also in this case, it, was, uh, it, it, it is often used uh, as an integration of, uh, of the agricultural activity. So uh, the research and innovation to be done will be uh, the study of the most suitable varieties because the mountain uh, um, areas, in particular the terraced uh, uh, land is very particular and uh, the most traditional and cultivated varieties do not fit this environment. And uh, of course there will, there will be need to improve the economic sustainability uh, by mechanization and uh, smart solutions. So, passing from Valtellina to Valle Camonica, in this case, we want to talk about uh, uh, this phenomenon uh, by uh, bringing uh, a particular study case of uh, a farm that is uh, Alena, uh, Alena Organic Farm that is. Uh, in Malegno, in the middle of uh, Valle Camonica. So this farm is really interesting from many points of view uh, because it's led by young entrepreneurs and uh, is a, a farm uh, based on the uh, promotion of the land and the traditional resources. For example, the use of land races, many of which were studied and promoted by our research center, is multifunctional and uh, is looking for smart solution as a short supply, ch supply chain and e-commerce through which they can sell 40 uh, products produced in the farm directly to uh, consumers. So the most recent uh, Alena farm strategy was uh, uh, the olive grove. So pro the production of olive oil. Why this? Because uh, they saw their farmers, uh, other farmers uh, in the valley that were uh, successfully uh, growing uh, this plant, so they follow them. And uh, to increase the farm's offer with a new product uh, with, of the highest uh, quality and value. Of course, uh, again, climate change had uh, is, its role in the, in the choice because uh, the olive growing in the valley was already present as in Valtellina but uh, it looks more feasible uh, in the recent years uh, due to the perception of less cold winters. So by now, the olive grove uh, is occupying the 15% of the farm with uh, uh, 500 trees in 4,000 uh, square meters. And uh, uh, this is also because it's a test for the farm uh, to test the, agron the agronomic and harvesting practices and to test uh, the fact that it is located uh, again uh, in a terraced uh, and uh, unaccessible uh, uh, land. So the farm again uh, need rustic and resistant varieties uh, suitable uh, both for the particular uh, environmental conditions uh, and for low input cultivation because it is an organic farm. It is in a fragile territory that is, uh, of course, the mountains. But uh, uh, they told me if the test is successful, of course, they are going to increase uh, the olive grove area. Again, this led to a landscape improvement because the, the farm recovered the land from dust particles that couldn't be used individually, they, that were coming from a previous generation and were divided uh, in, the, in the young generation. I mean, uh, they were very little uh, lands that couldn't be used individually. And also they, uh, uh, they restored uh, the road system on the plot, um, restoring also the 
traditional uh, structure as uh, uh, dry walls. So uh, the terraced lands were, was uh, recovered with unquestionable advantages on the land and uh, on the, la the landscape. So I concluding, uh, hoping that the olive oil together with all uh, the agricultural products of the mountains will, of the mountains will receive uh, the adequate promotion and attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valeria, for bringing these uh, very interesting uh, case studies. And uh, indeed, as you mentioned, new research needs to be done on uh, what are the adaptive capacity of olive trees and how this trend will go further and if it's a for, uh, possibility for future use, for example, of uh, mountain lands and valorization. So now we'll keep talking about land management and about another key trend that's happening because of climate change, that's the raise of no native tree species. I would uh, like to then give the floor to Katarina Lapin. So just to introduce this last uh, uh, good practice. So some of uh, these uh, no native tree spaces, as we know, they are extremely dangerous and they pose risk for the native biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. But also uh, there is, uh, they can contribute to mitigate and to adapt to climate change and create new bioeconomy value chains and via products and services in some cases. So here I give the floor to Katerina Lapin. So you are head of the Department for Forest Biodiversity and Nature Conservation at the Federal Forest Research Center, Austria. And you are also coordinator of the Interreg Alpine Space Alp Trees Project. So, Katerina, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you very much, Carla, for this lovely introduction and for being here. And I wish everyone a nice afternoon. And I'm very happy we continue talking about trees. And um, the previous talks have been very inspiring to me. And I, I heard a lot of like key phrases which are relevant to our quite specific project. And I want to thank for this already in advance. So I'm sharing my screen now and I hope it works. And and I think Carla already gave a fantastic uh, introduction to the dilemma of non-native tree species. On the one hand, uh, some of them can be very risky. On the other hand, they can be an opportunity for adaptation to climate change. At least they are also discussed it among the forest foresters, but also in cities. So that's why we created 2019, uh, actually already 18, then it got uh, funded by the European Development Fund uh, in 2019. Uh, we created the Alp Trees Project and the long complicated title, which also includes the aims, is to develop a transnational cooperation for the sustainable use and management of non-native tree species in urban and uh, peri-urban forest and forest ecosystems in the Alpine region. So today I will draft some, I, um, uh, I will show you something we uh, developed within the small project um, on how uh, to how to communicate, how to uh, develop like a transnational network, our, some of our outputs, and also about the economic opportunities which come along with the risks of non-native tree species. Perhaps this is an example for one or the other, uh, for other European projects with similar complications and trade-offs between biodiversity and climate change uh, adaptation and um, yeah, let's start with two very important things. <laughs> so this is our project area. So this is important because everything when we talk about non-native tree species, they are non-native to this area, but they might be native to other parts of Europe. So as you might be familiar with the Alpine Space Program, this is the area where it's covered, it's 48 regions and the home to uh, 70 million inhabitants. And another thing which is quite important to know is what actually non-native tree species are. So I cannot start a presentation without again to emphasize, to really define always what it is. And so on the one hand, we have native tree species, about 150 in this region, which originated there naturally, which naturally grow there and which have grown there since the last ice age. And uh, here you see some examples, maybe you are able to identify the one or the other, if not, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> identification handbooks we also produced in this project. 
Uh, and then on the other hand, we have those non-native trees. You can call them exotic trees, non-indigenous trees, introduced trees, and so on. And this include all the tree species which have been introduced, some of them already 400 or even 200 years ago for very different reasons. Some of them like the Douglas fir here on the left has been introduced for the timber production. Already uh, 200 years ago, they were experimenting whether this North American species is performing better uh, the native species. Some of them have arrived in the 18th century accidentally, like the tree of heaven, which you see here in the middle. It's just um, uh, spreading and spreading all over different ecosystems and it's hard to control. That's why it's also regulated by the European legislation on invasive species. And then there are some newcomers from Asia, like the Palovnia tomentosa, which might be interesting for the production of um, uh, uh, of um, energy pellets and uh, and other like it's a extremely fast growing species so all these are non-native tree species but within this group of non-native tree species we do distinguish archaeophytes which are trees uh, which have been introduced uh, a long time ago for medical purposes or for food purposes like um, the walnut which was introduced by the Romans and uh, many many fruit trees which are here since a very 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 long time so we are not um, not talking about them so much when we talk uh, about non-natives in the project but more about those neophytes which have been there is a definition that those species have been introduced after uh, the discovery of uh, North America that's kind of a baseline which was drawn and they again separate in two interesting groups don't those non-native tree species which show no negative impact so far on the ecosystems and those invasive tree species or potentially in uh, invasive tree species which possess a negative impact on biodiversity so we have for example citrus libani which is a uh, quite useful for the timber industry, quite useful tree species, which is con uh, considered non-invasive. Then we have Pseudotsuga mincisi, which is a species where it really depends on where it's planted. So in the environmental context, um, it's still considered a non-invasive species very far in the alpine space. And then there are some tree species like Plurus enrotina, where we know they're invasive, but I don't plant it. So in the project, you can find also uh, all those deliverables on the homepage, on the Altris homepage. I have always put in here the link, perhaps the slides are available for you later. But we have identified 526 non-native tree species in the alpine space, in forests and in urban areas. And as you can see on those graphs in the gray area, those are the species, number of species uh, growing in urban areas. Uh, 161 in both in forests and in urban areas and very few of them actually only in forests so the percentage of non-native tree species in the alpine space used in forests is under three percent so it's very low in the moment and um, but it's still important to talk about them already because um, tree development, forest development, it's a long-term project and uh, non-natives are in discussion to be an um, and, and, and tool for climate change adaptation. So uh, yeah, so do you find more statistics also when, uh, uh, when we look into the perception on non-native tree species? So here we identified that stakeholders in forests, so forest um, managers, forest owners, and um, other stakeholder groups represented in uh, representing the forest sector are perceiving non-native tree species extremely differently. So in uh, Austria, for in Germany, in Switzerland, and the answer were mostly okay. It depends on the use and so on. While, for example, uh, in France and in Slovenia, it really uh, non-natives are more perceived with it has a risk. Um, towards biodiversity. So the view or the perception of non-natives are very different. Perhaps also one explanation is because of their very different um, ecosystem services they were used for in the regions. Ecosystem services are important key, key word for us because those non-native tree species 
are uh, pro have been promoted in the past for certain ecosystem services, which they um, show kind of a positive impact here in, in violet. So for example, wind protection, soil protection here, uh, non-native tree species are perceived all over the alpine space among the stakeholders as benefiting, while a more negative impact was of course um, to see uh, when it comes to, to biodiversity and all the cultural heritage here, we see some, um, some uh, constraints or some from the stakeholders perspective. I cannot say too much for now about the ecosystem services. We try to assess this for the entire alpine space. So here you see two maps. Uh, we just uh, also analyzed like the carbon sequestration um, effort estimations uh, in the forest cover. And here also we try in the future, in the next year, to estimate the role of non-natives in the, in the alpine region. You see that within a very quite, when you compare it to Europe, quite a small area, you have a very diverse um, uh, set of, of, of predictions um, awaiting us and it really needs local solutions, but also like a transnational view on different ecosystem services and risks. But why we are here now is of course to talk about the business opportunities and of, of non-native tree species and the risks they might inhibit. So we analyze the usage value of the non-native tree species uh, in a separate uh, analysis of the alpine space. We analyze the different wood qualities uh, and quantities of non-native tree species. And we found out that of uh, the Douglas fir and Quercus rubra and Euglans nigra were the most um, traded um, species by volume. And, but when it comes, for example, to the price, picture looks a little bit different. So Euglans nigra, for example, is by far, so here is the black walnut, uh, North American species is by far the most expensive wood which was used. We were looking for in uh, expert and stakeholder in, and um, um, business interviews with, uh, with different uh, entrepreneurs. We were looking uh, into the use cases of non-native tree species. So for Robinia, which is also a North American tree species, we found actually the most industrial uh, uses for uh, wood flooring or outdoor uh, timber or timber constructions and so on. And the other non-native tree species play a role more in the local experimental, let's say carpenting market. And you find uh, quite nice ideas from individual uh, entrepreneurs how to use non-native tree species. And we interviewed a bit more into the depth, what are actually so how they think about non-native tree species when they produce, uh, when, they, when they use uh, the timber, right? So most of them uh, see the economic benefits and uh, they, there was an interest in keeping or increasing the economic benefits of non-native tree species and non-native, um, some non-native, um, but it's lacking in, and the quality, the marketing, and there's still more room for, for research, uh, definitely as in, this was one of the major outputs also of the, the uh, over uh, 32 interviews we made with uh, different uh, um, representatives of different, uh, um, yeah, of, of different uh, businesses. And uh, we had some gaps. Uh, there is a supply chain gap basically and uh, they all agreed that there is not enough non-native tree species to really give some sufficient estimations uh, whether they can be useful and um, of course um, the, the availability of the timber is quite is rather scattered and also the volumes are small and it's more can be only used that for only for product niches so why is this the case we were asking ourselves and actually it's the risks that non-native tree species have Right. So the risks are that when you plant a non-native uh, species, an alien species, or release one, it doesn't matter. It doesn't need only to be a tree. And there's always a risk that after a while, and this time span is quite unknown for very often, uh, that the species can establish and reproduce into areas uh, where uh, you cannot manage them in, anymore. And if it's becoming invasive, it's really uh, spreading so uh, fast that you cannot. 
um, manage it anymore or not in a very cost efficient way. And it's threatening ecosystems and biodiversity and also the entire way how, how we actually live. So this jump from alien species to invasive alien species is a serious uh, global problem, which is increasing with uh, tr increasing global trade and also climate change. So in other words, here we have this jump from non-native, uh, from non-invasive trees to invasive trees. And it's very hard sometimes to find out whether a new species will be invasive in future. So there is always kind of a risk which is unpredictable. This makes it not so attractive to use for forests, of course, especially when you have also a lot of uh, native tree species who which form um, habitats. So we have uh, identified the um, the um, uh, the impacts. So non-native invasive uh, non-native trees, um, like uh, for example the tree of heaven. Or, or other non-natives, they compete for resources with the native species, they change uh, chemical or the physical impact of the site. They have a lot of indirect and very understudied impacts uh, with interaction with other species and of course structural impacts, which we have uh, discovered in one of our case studies. So we have five pilot action where we tried to estimate the risks. One of them was done in Freiburg. Uh, by the colleagues of the FOR. And here you can see nicely in the picture how the spread of the red oak in this particular ecosystem, um, how, the, how the species, first of all, is spreading and uh, how it really changes the structural parameter, the light conditions for the regeneration of the native species. So I'm not going to detail here, but I want to show you that it's a quite a tricky thing. We developed a risk assessment a, uh, an, a tool whether so that a forest owner or a forest um, in management institution can decide whether the tree species um, is um, no risk for this specific area. Uh, it can have a possess a potential impact, so you can um, use it under certain conditions and whether the species should not be used at all. If you're interested on this, we, we, do the, we are going to publish this within the next month. And it was uh, a very, so we developed this eight step system to assess the risks. And as you can see, it's uh, complicated. You need a lot of data collected as well, but we tried to sum it up uh, in a very useful tool and we will provide also more site specific risk assessment. So you can see uh, the use of non-native tree species goes between risks and benefits, right? So really from uh, the, the, the moment when you plant the species, when it grows deliberately uh, to um, the harvest, the timber and the wood. So here along this um, scale, you find a lot of also economic opportunities we discussed. So we had a short brainstorming with the entire project team and uh, on which different economic opportunity, opportunities we see in non-native tree species in pre pre preparation of this today's uh, event. And we actually came up that non-native tree species and especially also those invasive ones are uh, located more on the list, uh, provide economic opportunities in future, or let's say needs for environmental consultants or maybe some uh, digital solutions for uh, biodiversity monitoring. Um, it includes tree nurseries, uh, plant health experts, conservation managers, environmental education, forest management, and uh, public com uh, communication in general. And on the benefit side, we have the, uh, the timber trade and import carpenters and so on who would benefit from the non-native. So I think uh, non-native tree species without that we were really looking for it actually offer a lot of economic or let's say opportunities which we will all uh, need also in future, let's say opportunities or let's say um, ways on um, like uh, we will need a lot of a lot a lot more um, people interested in this topic and also help us in future under the conditions of climate change to deal with those non-native tree species which are already here. Okay, so we have also all our outputs um, presented in podcasts, so you don't have to read the reports, <laughs> you can just listen to our podcasts. And we try to really show um, the the different opportunities, also the um, the, the results of the timber market analysis is uh, presented in form of a, pod, uh, of a podcast and you find much more information um, 
on the homepage. And I hope I wasn't talking too long. Here is the fantastic team of partners from 12 different institutions. And I, um, I feel very, very grateful to have this fantastic team from all over the Alpine space and this fantastic opportunity that we can work together under this quite complicated one and a half years. <laughs> so thank you very much. And I hope I didn't, um, yeah, I didn't bomb your time scale. <laughs> Thank you very much, Katerina. That was very interesting. And you gave us a very complete texture of non-native tree species. Also for those of you who are not experts on the topic, showing on one side the risk, but also the economic opportunities. So thank you very much for this such complete uh, point of view. So now we have 10 minutes left. I would like to open the floor to the question if you have. So do not hesitate. You can write in the chat and uh, we will ask your question to the speakers. Meanwhile, we, we have received uh, several comments. So people are happy from uh, your presentation and uh, very interested. We will send uh, the presentation and the report of the end uh, of the event uh, in the coming days for all participants. And uh, also, so uh, do not hesitate then to write in the chat if you have a question. Meanwhile, we have also a participant from the Himalayan mountains that's very interested about uh, the work that's done like from these good practices in Europe. And uh, I, I have a question for uh, Elena Vizhnar Malinowska. So if the if will the next generation EU program contribute to finance climate adaptation measure and how local actor can access those funds for developing adaptation measures? Thank you very much. Uh, the short reply is, of course. <laughs> Uh, the longer reply is that uh, a lot of funding uh, in the future is a shared management. And the first port of call for local author, uh, actors of the member states. And, uh, you know, that the, the, the path to funding doesn't go necessarily through Brussels, but it, it goes through your, uh, through your uh, capital or through your managing authority. Or uh, if you are lucky and you have uh, a country where there is a direct access of, uh, to funding by some municipalities because they have organized so, uh, then it's even better. Now, the, of course, what I hear often is uh, that the rules are very complicated. Um, there, I would like to say that we try to uh, simplify as much as possible and communicate, you know, what is the checklist, what do you need to do, and uh, it's, it's a learning exercise. You know, once you've done a project, and I see a lot of project promoters here, uh, Katarina, Valeria, Olivier and also Salvatore, <laughs> they, they are dealing with projects on, on a daily basis. It's once you, you've got it right for, for one, uh, then, then it's probably uh, easier for, for the other. What I would like really to advertise and for us, uh, you know, the LIFE program has been traditionally a sort of uh, laboratory and accelerator of very good projects that can be then, uh, you know, financed by bigger funds, uh, typically the uh, cohesion funding or the common agricultural policy funding. What, what I find also that, uh, you know, the mountainous regions or the local actors do not think often about agricultural policy because it has to do more with the farming, you know, activities. But uh, I, I believe a member, there should be a push on member states to look at, you know, the future of farming in a more integrated manner. You know, there will be a, a lot of uh, transitional uh, or transit or retreat uh, strategies needed and uh, search for, for new opportunities, for new areas, new sectors. We've heard about the uh, olive uh, sector. We've heard also about, you know, the, the whole year uh, tourism and, and so on and so forth. So, so really just don't uh, lose nerve. <laughs> it requires time. The first will, one will be uh, difficult. And yes, very important, create, uh, you know, communities communities of practice so that you can exchange this information and also with a bigger group uh, you you have probably also uh, a bigger degree uh, higher degree of, of success thank you and uh, i have also another question for olivier Rard. 
So I wanted to ask you if you think that uh, your model, the model that you have developed, can be applied to other ski stations and uh, why, in what cases? So if you can shortly answer to this. Well, we don't, we didn't have developed a, a model. We have, um, um, we are taking ingredients. So uh, the, the message uh, I can send is that uh, um, the first, uh, the first step of, um, of the method is to uh, the knowledge, the knowledge of, uh, of our climate, our biodiversity, uh, in order to plan what we, we are able to do. Uh, also, um, a real uh, state of uh, um, ski lift uh, wealth, uh, health um, state, uh, and um, that's I, I mean that's the first step. And the second step is to uh, um, to open uh, open your minds on the, all all the, the territory, not only on the ski resort. Um, and uh, first, uh, further steps is to um, um, to give some uh, um, to, to, to build engineering uh, to, to create uh, cooperation to uh, to develop uh, collective intelligence to innovate it. Uh, that's very very important. Uh, and um, and finally, it's uh, to manage the time. Uh, it's very important. So you have to start now because uh, 10 years, uh, 20 years is not so, so long, finally. Thank you. In fact, in fact, I think that uh, in a way you some have uh, time, people and the information data, which are really tricky lens that have been uh, said uh, widely in all the presentation. So uh, I would like now to conclude this webinar. Uh, thank you to you all for your participation. Thanks to speakers. So the presentation and the report of the event will be available in the coming days. And again, I would like to invite you all to the European Mountain Convention next year in uh, 11, 12 and 13 October uh, 2022 in Italy. You can find more information in uh, your Montana's webinar. And again, thank you to all for being here. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.